Thank you and welcome to the uh, webinar that is part of this, uh, the dissemination activities for the NERC ARIP uh, program. And as I said, this is the first sector specific uh, uh, webinar and today we're going to focus on the energy and power sector. In terms of uh, practicalities, um, as I said, uh, we will uh, welcome communicate, we will welcome questions from you. So please use, as you just did now, the question tab on the control panel on your right hand side. And in terms of questions to the speakers, as we have uh, four speakers today, please also, uh, if you want to ask a question to a specific uh, speaker, please also add uh, his name into your question so we can address the question to the proper speaker. And also just to let you know that the slides will be available on our website after this event. So uh, again, welcome everyone. As I said, we got a uh, very tight schedule today, a very tight program. Uh, my name is Ciro Daleo, I work for Syria. We are the program coordinator for the Environmental Risk to Infrastructure Innovation Program funded by the uh, NERC. Um, with me today, we have uh, Douglas Dodd from uh, National Grid, Professor Douglas Crawford Brown, University of Cambridge, Dr. Jeremy Phillips, uh, University of Bristol, and Dr. Sean Wilkinson from Newcastle University. Uh, I will give you just a quick overview about the ERIC program for those of you who don't know this. Um, it is a five million five year program and which bring, brings together uh, the Natural Environmental Research Council and also, of course, um, asset owners, operators, policy makers, consultants and academia to use environmental science to identify, quantify and manage environmental risk. The three themes of the ARI program are the ones that you can see on the screen. So team one, identifying, understanding, and quantifying environmental risks to the infrastructure system. Team two, likelihood, effect, and impact of the multi-hazard combinations on the infrastructure system. And team three, dealing with uncertainty in design, operational, and investment decisions. So uh, a bit more information on the program. It is translation focused, which means that uh, the projects that are funded translate existing science research into uh, relevant knowledge, methods, and tools for the industry. So it, the program is also industry-led, and uh, all the funded projects must have at least one uh, uh, industrial partner. And the project has to be impact-driven, so uh, they really need to deliver actual impacts and benefits to the industry partners and to the wider industry as well. And of course, it's uh, open. There's open competition in the program. In terms of the uh, partners of the program, as you can see on the screen, there's a very uh, good cohort of uh, uh, of partners, which uh, represent um, asset owners, consultants, but also regulators. And it is important to know that uh, the uh, partners of the project must not be necessarily uh, uh, ARIP partners. And to date, we've had uh, two funding call and one pilot call. We funded the, the program has funded 45 projects across the UK and awarded 3.6 million to 23 organisations. And uh, um, 142 researchers are involved in the funded project, and 78 industry partners are involved in one or multiple projects. Um, now we will hand over to Douglas Dodd, he's the Environmental Resilience Specialist at Natural Hazards and National Grid, and he's responsible for ensuring uh, that National Grid electricity transmission assets are resilient. His work also involves uh, the mitigation of risk and uh, risk to substation and other energy infrastructure, both above ground and buried. I will now hand over to Doug. Hi there. Can you Hello. Hear me? Yeah, apparently I'm unmuted now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this yeah, is Douglas Dodds, National Grid. Um, I was asked to put a very quick few slides together to highlight what, Nash, what keeps me awake at night in terms of um, natural hazard risks to National Grid. So what I've done is I've put together four slides just with a brain, with brain dump, basically. Um, 
And as you can see on the first one, one of our big concerns at the moment is the combined likely risk scenarios. Um, and by that, what we actually mean is, is when we look at risks, traditionally, we look at those risks in isolation. We look at a flooding risk to a site. We look at wind risk to a um, string of towers. We look at erosion risk to a riverbank which has a um, cable section in it. But we don't actually look at the combined risk and what the potential impacts from that. Now, one of the things that we sort of would be interested in looking at is using actual events and the data from actual events um, in order to demonstrate uh, what a realistic catastrophic event could be. And I mean, the, the best example I can give for that would be the East Coast surge um, with three months of uh, above average rainfall on a, each on a regional basis. So for what, what I mean by that is if you look at um, the northeast in terms of northeast Yorkshire, etc., um, if we'd had a very wet November, uh, well, a very wet October, November, December, the impacts from the East Coast surge a couple of years back could have been much, much worse. And that's not and that's not an unusual scenario. I think the other one that we uh, that concerns us is it's the secondary effects from flooding. So basically, we. We're quite confident we understand when water comes out of the sky and we understand it flooding on the ground. But what we don't understand is what we can't actually see the hazard from that water. So basically, how does that water interact moving through the ground um, with other geohazard risks? For example, is the changes in rainfall patterns impacting um, the stability of the ground? beneath our feet and we can't actually see that uh, occurring very easily until it actually until it actually happens. Uh, um, so that's another one that keeps us keeps us concerned at the moment. Um, go on the next slide please. Traditionally what we, we, we tend to do in National Grid is we manage our risks through design standards. So in terms of uh, natural hazards we, we we ensure that our uh, design standards are fit for purpose for the near, for the future in terms of near future. And what that means is we'll design our system to cope with a set standard of wind loading, a set standard of flood resilience, uh, a set uh, standard for, um, for heat, it's not heat loading, but uh, basically to, to, to deal with um, heat iron effects etc um, but one of the things that we don't understand is when should we start to invest um, it's all very well be having having this information now that in 50 60 70 80 years time we're going to have um, two three degrees extra but when should we start to invest to allow for uncertainties um, and to allow for the lifespan of an asset, for example, we have an we have assets which can range from sort of 50 to uh, 80 years on our system. Now, we would like to start um, investing in, in resilience now if we can, but in some cases, is it too soon to invest in that resilience? So, I mean, that's a, that sort of ties in with um, tranche three of the. Uh, of the of the, um, of the previous uh, presentation, in terms of we, we want to understand when is the most optimal time for investment, um, and a similar thing for wind load and snow load, um, and as I said, the the the, the life lifespan of the asset dictates when we should start to begin to invest and in what what would be the optimal time for that. Um, and also, I mean, based on it's based on climate change projections. But projections, as we know, um, we have to have confidence in those projections in order to base you know, multi-billion-pound investment decisions on. Um, so it, it's got to be fairly firm science to to justify that. Now, the next slide, please. Flooding challenges. Our investment in flood resilience is based on ensuring that 
the resilience to today's and future flooding risks. That's fine in practice, in in theory, but in practice, um, what we're finding is data changes frequently. So you, it's it's very hard to actually say um, develop an investment program on resilience when sites that you didn't think were at risk, the risks have reduced, the risks have increased. It's effectively a moving target. Um, so it's not to say that the data is wrong, it's just as we get more data or increased data, it can sometimes cloud the issue. Um, I think part of the problem with that is this is the terminology between defending against the one in a thousand year risk or one in a hundred year risk and I think the movement of, of seeing of movement to the percentile um, risk is a good move now but it's it, it's I think we need to have sort of set targets around that nationally um, and possibly industry led as well um, so yeah in terms of uh, the very low risk sites, we do, we're looking at those very closely to say, well actually should we be investing in the defence now or should we be waiting until the, the risk is firm, firmly understood? Uh, um, based on feedback from the, uh, or based on the latest review of flooding uh, from Cumbria, it would appear that there is a, a lean towards more demandable defences. Uh, being a more reasonable approach for the very low risk sites. However, that has its own set of challenges in, its, in itself. Um, which, can I have the next slide, please? So basically, yeah, basically the, um, the challenges around the mobile defences are one that really start to, to, to open up the uh, decisions on whether or not you should invest in permanent defences or demandable mobile defences for these low risk sites um, and we would like to have a bit more firm evidence, a bit more signs behind how we do that and um, where we do that and not just as a, an in, not just as national good but actually as a whole because we, we have um, commitments to and um, support the DNOs and other energy uh, partners uh, during an, during emergency events. So I mean, it, it, there is a, there's, a, there's work to do around sort of um, what are the optimal solutions for um, demountable barrier solutions. Um, and I think that's that that's just a, a taste or, or a, to, uh, as I say, a brain dump of, of what sort of keeps us awake at night at the moment. Um, so I'll be, I'll be very interested in a few of the presentations coming through now. Um, but I don't know, are you taking questions now or at the end? Oh. Thank Hello. you, Doug. The questions, yeah, thank you, Doug. The questions would be uh, at the end. So thank you for this quick uh, uh, overview. And uh, I will now hand over to Professor Douglas Crawford Brown. He is uh, the director of the Cambridge Center for Climate Change Mitigation Research. He's got more than 35 year, years of experience of research and policy engagement on energy and youth environment, including work with the governments of the US, UK, Germany, Abu Dhabi, China, Taiwan, France, Mexico and Thailand and this talk will focus on a recent uh, ERIC funded research project examining the use of social and climate science information in the investment in renewables. So hand, hand over to you, uh, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, oh, I, got, I have a terrible echo here. Um, I hope everybody's not hearing the same echo. Um, um, Sirio, may I ask, are you seeing me in screen mode or? Uh, oh, there we go, there we go. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay well, welcome everybody. Um, uh, as it says on the slide here, I am 
now retired. I retired in, in January, although I'm still associated with the university. Um, the work that you're going to see was really done by Aideen Foley, um, now at Burbeck, and Phil Holden at um, uh, Open University. Um, so even though I'm a physicist, the, um, the work that I did on this had more to do with the social science side of that. And that has to do with the fact that uh, increasingly uh, my time is spent working with investors around the world in, in the renewable energy sphere. So then let me give you a brief overview of what the talk will consist of. I'm going to frame the issue that we were looking at in the research describe the future technology transformation model, which forms the uh, understanding of how investments would go forward and how those investments are improved by the climate science information. Then a very brief uh, overview of the projections of the wind energy resources. Uh, and then I'll describe the survey that we did of, of energy investors and then finally draw a few conclusions for you to take forward. So first, framing the issue, while this was a NERC project and, and really our focus was on the science underlying it and the application of that science to decision making, there were three related users of the results. So these were groups that made use of the, um, uh, the package of materials that we put together as part of this NERC project. One was the Financing the Future of Energy project, which I invite you to take a look at on the internet if you just Google in Financing the Future of Energy. You'll find our report about that, and that went off to investors who were interested in, in wind energy and other renewable energies, but wind energy is the topic for today. The TopDAD Tool Supported Policy Development for Regional Adaptation Project made use of these results to understand how investors would respond to adaptation strategies for um, wind energy in particular. And then finally, uh, the results were used in the UK climate change risk assessment, um, the, the, the latest one that a number of us were on. Um, so just a couple of very quick points before we get into the, the heart of the discussion. There is a, a looming global energy gap. Um, we have consumption, which is projected, as we'll see in just a minute, to rise by a factor of three or four around the world. Uh, but at the same time, in many developed nations, we're, we're closing down some of the power sources. Um, so we have this gap that's arising, and wind energy is a, a, a crucial part of this gap or a crucial part of filling this gap. This shows the, the growth in demand. You see that places like India and, and, and China and the, the Middle East as having the largest percentage growth. And in those countries, they are keenly interested in wind energy. I'm going to be focusing almost entirely on UK wind energy today. Um, but it's important to realize that the, the lessons that we drew from this study apply equally to places like India and China and the Middle East, where, where in many of the cases, they're interested in energy systems that, are, that don't require the grid. They, they, they can't afford to bring, particularly in India, they can't afford to bring a national grid in. And so they're looking for supplies, generation capacity that doesn't require bringing in a national grid. And wind turbines have the ability to, to do that, along with solar and some other uh, sources. And renewables are a major way of, of hitting this target. So I've got this uh, phrase, which I just used down in Dubai um, recently. Uh, did you know that renewables accounted for 50% of the new power generation capacity investment globally in the past five years? This is a little deceptive because notice it says new power generation. It doesn't include the investment in just yanking oil and gas out of the ground and selling it on the market. And if you do that, then oil and gas uh, um, are by far the largest, and coal are by far the largest source of investment. But those are not new power generation capacities. Those are, are fuel production. So the central research questions are, how could climate change affect variability? Uh, how might this take place both temporally and spatially under the different uh, representative concentration pathways? How might these affect the rate of deployment of wind energy? And what information needs do the wind energy investors, the wind energy companies need in order to take their investment and deployment decisions? So that's the, the focus of my talk, and we'll go quickly through how we did that. So we move to the future technology transformation model just very quickly on this one. 
This is a model that looks at how investors take decisions when energy prices change, when levelized cost of energy changes, when you have different policies, subsidies, feed-in tariffs, and so forth in place, and um, uh, how is it that one ends up with different portfolios of energy. And so what we're looking at in this in this project was, what we, what we were looking at is how uncertainty in wind energy and the reduction of that uncertainty by the climate information would affect the um, the relative movement of wind energy compared to solar, coal, gas, and so forth. Uh, a key point that we're going to be looking at, or a key point that goes into the model, is what's called the quantity cost curve. Normally people talk about a learning curve in which the price of something goes down as you learn more and you build more and more of it. But in something like wind energy, you can have an, an, an inverse kind of a curve where in the very early days you're getting at the land that's not very expensive, and then as you start moving towards land that is more expensive and potentially has lower wind associated with it, the cost per uh, megawatt hour generated can start to go up. And notice that there are the uncertainty bounds placed on these on this curve, and it's those uncertainty bounds, those red lines that we're trying to narrow in the work that we've done, and then to help the investors understand how that narrowing would influence their uh, their decisions on investments. And when you do this with uh, future technology transformation, what you find are curves such as this one. So the, the awful, awful green color uh, that you see there is just onshore capacity. Offshore is also part of the, the analysis. And it shows what the projection is out to 2050 if in the UK you had absolutely no policy or subsidy associated with um, wind or renewables or, or what have you. And then on the next slide, you get the same curve, but with a, a high carbon price, which is beginning to approach the $100 per ton of CO2 by 2050, and technology subsidies, so, so wind energy actually receiving a subsidy. It might be a direct subsidy, it might be a feed-in tariff, what have you. Um, but the point is that in order to hit our carbon targets, we're going to have to start getting onto this kind of a curve with, um, with solar and with wind. So now we look at the projections of wind energy resources, which I'll just cover uh, very briefly, simply because there's a lot of science behind it. Others are, are better positioned to talk about that science. And we, we generated estimates of the, uh, in a gridded system over the UK and out into the waters, we generated estimates of both the min, mean wind speed and the variability of that wind speed, and we did it under four uh, primary representative concentration pathways. They're the classic ones that, that you normally see of uh, RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6, and 8.5. I'm obviously not going to present you with all of these pathways here, just a couple of representative results. And so this next slide shows you, for the model that was used, the plasm NSEM model, it shows you uh, some of the results for uh, mean wind speed, and on the next slide I'm going to show you the variability of the wind speed. And so this is the primary climate science information generated for each of the RCPs. If we go to the next slide, then you get an, an, a picture of the amount of variability of the of the wind speed under these various RCPs, uh, again, for different time periods. So we did it for 2020, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Okay, and, and then what we were interested in was how people are going to use this information if they had these climate projections and if they believed the climate projections, a big issue, um, how would this information play a role in changing their investment decisions? And we had about 20 investors and companies that participated in a uh, what's called the Delphi method um, approach to a survey. And we had three categories of questions. What do you perceive the risk to be? What information would better inform your decision? And can you, at the moment, respond to uh, this information on climate change? Do you have any strategy in place? 
And so now just a couple of the results here. Is it long-term average or variability of wind that is important to you? And what you can see is that the percentage of the respondents here is uh, weighted towards the people who are interested in the variability, this climate information on variability, rather than on, on long-term averages. And I think that also would be of interest to, uh, to Douglas and the National Grid. The second one is, uh, what will climate change do to your business? Will it be a, a large effect or a small effect? And what you can see here is, of the a dozen or so who responded to this particular question, um, most of them said that they didn't see climate change out to 2050 having any effect on their business, even after we presented the climate information. Some said they had positive effects. Only a few said they had they foresaw negative effects. Now, I, I, I want to caution you. This this is the view of investors who may have a very short-term um, view of how long they're going to be in the investment. They often want to be in in five years and out again. The time scale of concern to the wind companies was dominated by um, uh, no concern whatsoever. Uh, the rest of them um, were anywhere between short and, and long-term. And I'll let you take a look at the slide and, and you can see what the distribution is. And then are additional data needed? So uh, over 50% of the stakeholders, of the 20 stakeholders that participated, reported that they currently had no strategy, no strategy at all for coping with climate change induced changes in, in wind energy potential. Um, I, at first we were taken aback by that. We thought that was quite surprising. Um, but I think in, in retrospect, given that it's the the short-term investors who are who are making these decisions about investment, perhaps things out to 2050, 2080, and so forth are not so much of, of interest to them. And as a result, they had not developed any strategy at all uh, for coping with climate change-induced uh, changes in, in wind energy potential. But what they did say was that social information was absolutely the most important thing for them. They needed to know on a, on a geographic map what the differences were in public attitudes. They were particularly interested in, and we've now produced, a GIS map of, of communities, municipalities uh, that have um, already approved wind turbines to be located on specific plots of land. So the by far the largest concern that they expressed was that they would start moving forward um, with an expensive survey of a bit of, of land to put wind turbines on, only to find that after a couple of million pounds were spent on planning, uh, that public attitude turns against them and they weren't able to, to cite their facility. Um, so they, they were more interested in the social information than they were in the climate information, although again, many of, many of them, you'll notice, did have an interest in the climate information. So just a few conclusions uh, for the final slide, that these investment decisions are largely at the moment robust to climate projections, simply saying that the investors don't necessarily take into account the climate projections. Um, and at the moment, they're not playing a significant role. But as one starts to see more um, uh, change in wind, one can imagine that these would become more important to them. Number two, that the wind power companies all along the supply chain uh, need support in understanding public opinions and, and planning permission. That's where their primary information need is at the moment. Number three, where there is wind information that is required from taking investment decisions, it's about variability and not necessarily necessarily about average wind speed. In other words, they feel very comfortable that they know what the average wind speed will do. Um, they're not as comfortable to understand how much the variability is going to change. And then finally, if you remember that cost uh, curve that I showed earlier, quantity cost curve, uh, uncertainty there is important to the, the um, uh, wind investors, but there that uncertainty is arising primarily because of the economics and the policy side of the issue. So the policy side telling you where you can and cannot put uh, projects without running into significant uh, uh, feedback or significant um, opposition from the, the local population, um, and that then therefore influences the, the levelized cost of the energy. Okay, so that's everything I have, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. If you want to contact me on any of this, here's my, my contact information. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doug.
I will now hand over to uh, Dr. Jeremy Phillips. He is a reader in uh, physical volcanology at the University of Bristol. He specializes in the application of physics-based models to predict volcanic processes and associated hazards and risks. His talk will focus on the impact of volcanic ash on the energy infrastructure, specifically on the nuclear generating facility. So, hand over to Jeremy. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Hope you can hear me. So I'm going to talk today about long-range volcanic ash impacts onto UK infrastructure. This is a project that was conducted jointly between volcanologists at the University of Bristol and uh, EDF Energy staff. And, and, and Jeremy, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we cannot see your, your slides at the moment, so if you can uh, uh, share your screen. Uh, Okay, can you see them now? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no so the the ERIC project um, was focused on volcanic ash hazard to UK nuclear generating facilities, uh, and in this project we've produced a, an ash hazard assessment for nuclear generating facilities in the UK, and that includes a, a database of simulations for volcanic ash deposition onto the UK. This has led to some improved understanding of credible ash hazard for the operation of UK nuclear power plants. And EDF are taking forward some of the results of this project to look at mitigation strategies um, for future energy supply. So the 2010 eruption of Eyjafjallajökull Yerkel from Iceland highlighted that small to moderate sized volcanic eruptions can have continental scale impacts. So on the right hand side of this side, slide, I'm showing you a schematic which shows um, uh, how we measure the size of volcanic eruptions. We use a scale called VEI or Volcanic Explosivity Index and it's a logarithmic scale based on erupted volume. It's analogous to the Richter scale for earthquakes. Ayafiatli Urkel was a VEI three to four size eruption, so a fairly moderate size eruption, but it was influential on adding volcanic hazards to the UK National Risk Register. So what we remember about this eruption was the impact it had, the impact of airborne volcanic ash on European airspace. So on the left-hand side of this slide, I'm showing the, uh, the propagation of the ash cloud down over Europe from 14th of April to 18th of April. This resulted in restrictions to European airspace for six days, cancellation of over 100,000 flights, and a significant cost associated that with that, which primarily came from the issues around staffing, maintenance, and supply chain, essentially having aircraft stranded in the wrong locations at the wrong times. So just over a year later, May 2011, there was another Icelandic eruption, Grimsverten. This was a smaller, shorter duration event, about three hours. Um, uh, during this eruption, ash was again transported down over, over Europe, and uh, ash was deposited on the UK, um, uh, and by the time this eruption occurred, there was a systematic protocols were in place for collecting and um, measuring the ash samples, um, and this was coordinated by the British Geological Survey. So in this talk, I'm going to uh, just summarize our ash hazard assessment for UK infrastructure. We're going to identify the volcanic sources and the likelihood of their eruption. Um, we're going to then present results from the forward dispersion modeling. So for given volcano locations and weather patterns, we're going to identify the likelihood that ash is transported to the UK. And then we're going to combine these bits of information to identify the probability that ash will be deposited onto UK sites and identify some key eruption scenarios that result from that. So in our ERIC project, we then 
conducted an expert elicitation exercise with EDF staff who had specialist expertise in the particular types of site plant that were involved and we used that expert elicitation to identify potential impacts to nuclear power generation. I won't be talking about that work in my talk today. So if we start off, um, we identified volcanoes within 3,000 kilometers of the UK that we, uh, so this was the range over which we thought ash uh, would affect the UK. This gives us, in this area, 88 known volcanoes uh, and from catalogues of um, rec uh, ge geological records of, uh, and historical records of their activity, there are two that we use, Smithsonian GVP and the Global Volcano Model, we are we are able to identify 1,300 known eruptions from those 88 volcanoes. And we conducted a, a cluster analysis to group those volcanoes by location. This gave us nine location clusters, and you can see on the slide we've got Iceland, the Azores, the Canaries, Italy, and parts of the Aegean, which are all regions which are currently volcanically active. But at the low probabilities, low occurrence probabilities that are important for impacts, potential impacts on nuclear plant, then we also need to consider regions uh, that haven't been recently volcanically active, and that includes the Eiffel volcanic field in Germany, the Massive Central in France. So with the information from the eruption catalogues, um, which gives us the size of the eruptions and uh, their frequency of occurrence, we can produce uh, a frequency magnitude curve for each of our nine different cluster locations. So here on the plot you're seeing annual exceedance probability against size of eruption by VEI measure. And we did some uh, Bayesian statistical analysis around the catalogue sampling so to identify the confidence intervals in these frequency magnitude predictions, which are shown by the size of the red regions. Uh, we then conducted some forward dispersion modeling uh, from those volcano locations for different size eruptions into different weather patterns. We used a standard atmospheric advection diffusion model, which takes as input grain size distribution or a range of particle sizes which, uh, um, which are injected into the atmosphere at some height and some rate which is proportional to the size of the volcanic eruption and then these part the ash particles are dis dispersed by the wind and, atmospheric and by atmospheric turbulence and then deposited onto the ground. So in the blue panel I'm going to show you uh, a movie of one of the simulation results. This is a simulation of a VEI four size eruption from Iceland into a northwesterly wind, which is essentially very similar to the conditions during 2010 eruption of Eyjafjallajökull. Yerkel. In the bottom panel, what you will see is the ground level concentration of ash at a site in the southwest of the UK, which is given by the red dot on the map. Um, and as we watch the movie, the color map that we see will be the airborne ash concentration uh, in the ash cloud. So if I just run this now, then what we see is the ashes uh, released from the eruption started to be dispersed down over northern Europe following the wind patterns. We see ash arriving at the southwest of the UK, the concentration increasing and then decreasing as the ash is advected off towards the Mediterranean. So on this plot, I've at the bottom, I've included two important thresholds. One is the, air, the concentration of ash at which aviation would be restricted under current guidelines, and uh, a much lower concentration, which is relevant, is where air quality starts to be impacted at ground levels. And what we can see is for this site, the aviation hazard level was exceeded for about 15 hours or so, but the ground level air quality um, threshold was exceeded for a much longer period of time. So we, we used as input into the model, to force the model, we used 
29 synoptic or large-scale weather patterns that can be used to describe the weather over northern Europe. So essentially, we, div we could divide up the, the, the weather across a given, a given year into one of, of these 29 different weather patterns, and we uh, did some work with uh, a catalogue of wind records over a 30 odd year period so that we could then identify the frequency of occurrence of these different weather regimes. We simulated uh, VEI sized eruptions from three to seven from our nine regional clusters under these 29 synoptic weather patterns. That gives us a simulation database of about 1300 model runs. Um, we used as input into the model runs an ash grain size distribution, which is representative of European volcanoes. And each simulation run was 90 hours in duration following an eight hour eruption, which is the typical size from the database records of, of eruptions in volcan for volcanoes around the UK. So combining the frequency magnitude relationship for the, each of the cluster regions with the probability of occurrence of uh, eruptions of different sizes and weather regimes, we're able to produce uh, a, a set of curves which describe the probability that ash might be deposited onto the UK. And here I'm showing an example of that, which is the duration that the concentration exceeds a given threshold, and the thresholds are shown by the different colored lines on the plot against the annualized probability of exceedance. So uh, a level of 500 micrograms per cubic meter is a, an, a relevant threshold for potential maintenance of air filtration systems. And we can see from this plot, which is average for the whole of the UK, that the probability that we might get these conditions persisting for a 24 hour period is on average about one in 300 years. The, the way we have, it's important to state that the way we have uh, used the synoptic weather patterns means that these probability estimates we've produced here are, are, are conservative, so they, re they reflect the maximum likely hazard here. So uh, these kind of <coughs> return intervals and these thresholds, essentially we were looking at, uh, at fairly low ground level concentrations and the impacts that we expect to be important at those ground level concentrations or deposition thicknesses uh, really impact on public health, uh, potentially on transport and on some site infrastructure. So in the context of public health, we would expect these levels of ash may give irritation to breathing and eyes, uh, exacerbation of pre-existing respiratory conditions, so there may be impacts on workforce to consider. Um, roads may become obscured and slippery, uh, airport runways may become slippery um, and there may be possible disruption to systems that are associated with rail travel as well. So transportation may be a key issue here. And in terms of infrastructure, we anticipate main impacts at these low levels to be around the, the uh, clogging or increased maintenance of air and water filtration systems and potentially water treatment systems as well. We may be getting close to thresholds where flashover of HV systems may start to become an issue of concern as well. And essentially the important thing is to also emphasize that some of these issues will have effects that cascade into supply chain issues and potentially communication issues as well. So just to summarize our results, the, the model simulations we ran suggested that under all weather conditions from all eruptive sources, ash could be transported to the UK. Um, as I said before, for relevant thresholds um, for filter clogging and potentially maintenance, um, we're expecting these events lasting between 24 and 48 hours to occur about one in 300 year annual recurrence interval. Uh, the most likely source of ash to the UK is from Iceland, uh, but large eruptions from the Azores, the Canaries in Italy can also re result in ash being transported to the UK under certain wind conditions. 
the majority of the ash particles that will arrive at the UK will be PM10 sized or smaller. That means they'll be respirable. And so we expect that the main impacts from these ground level concentrations will be on site infrastructure filtration systems uh, and on human health potentially leading to issues of potent considering increased maintenance and possible workforce disruption in terms of mitigating against these effects. We certainly find in our simulations there are higher concentrations at, at lower return interval periods where we reach concentrations that may disrupt potentially air and ground transportation. So there's consideration of supply chain effects here. Uh, as a result of this project, we're going to make the database of our simulations available to the UK Cabinet Office. And it's important to point out that the principal uncertainty on these predictions comes from the variable duration of the eruptions and the persistence of the weather patterns. And this is research that we're taking forward to look into further after the end of this project. Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I will now hand over to Dr. Sean Wilkinson. Uh, he is a senior lecturer in structural engineering at Newcastle University. He is specialized in the resilience of critical infrastructure and how disruptions to the system can impact on society. He has developed a model that assesses the resilience of spatial distributed infrastructure to wind, and this presentation will be on the ERIC funded project quantifying the likely impacts of wind storms to the electrical infrastructure. Hand over to you, uh, Sean. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, hopefully you can all hear and see okay. Right, um, so uh, this project is a um, collaboration between a number of industry partners and obviously NERC, uh, in particular Western Power Distribution and the Energy Networks Association and also we're also working with and Doug Dodds of the National Grid and the Met Office are involved as well. So we've only just started the project, uh, well we've been going for a few months uh, now and due to finish in October 2017 uh, with those partners and I should mention my collaborators which are Dr Sarah Dunn and Dr Russell Adams who are uh, working with me and our industry partners. So the motivation behind this is that if you look at most of the faults and the electric, electricity disruptions that are on the um, distribution network as opposed to the transmission network, the transmission being what the national grid, the backbone that the national grid operate, and the distribution being the, the stuff that comes into your front door, uh, that wind is the greatest causer of faults and disruptions. Um, now, <coughs> when the district network operators who are responsible for maintaining these systems um, are aware when a storm has come and um, they will have a action plan when a storm is predicted uh, to try and mitigate the effects of those storms. The problem with any plan uh, like this is that if they um, have a false alarm then it is quite expensive for them. They, what they typically do is they put on extra linesmen to repair the faults, they'll put on extra operators in the call centers, they may um, have some sorts of mobile um, uh, defenses that are rolled out. So if, if there's a false alarm this can be very expensive for them, but even worse if they're under prepare then you get large scale disruptions and you also get um, potentially fined by the regulator and suffer of reputational loss. So the sorts of information that we all use uh, is a normal Met Office forecast. I just downloaded this off the Met Office site. This is a typical thing where you've got wind, maximum wind speeds um, predicted for say 24 or uh, 48 or even uh, four days in advance um, and you can make decisions about that. Um, and then the Met Office will also issue weather warnings based on their interpretation of what they think is going to happen based on their weather forecasts. So that's the sort of information that the district network operators are using at the moment. And we're 
working with them to say, well, can we do better than this? So the modeling framework that we're adopted comes from what the insurance industry uses to try and assess what their risk to a big storm event is. And I'll go through these various things, but what you need is a um, something to say, yes, some, something of importance is happening to work out how intense that is going to be, what assets are exposed to this storm, and combine these to make some sort of estimate of the damage, and from the damage, what is the consequence of those damage. So I'll go over each of these um, uh, various modules to our modeling framework. So we have some sort of, or as I say, we, we, we've, I'm only presenting the framework today uh, and a few results. We haven't got the final tool working yet. But what we do is we say, OK, if there is a weather event predicted, what do we need to decide whether or not that is going to be of interest to us? Uh, and it's not just for, we're only looking at wind, but it could be equally a heat wave or rainfall or something else. And um, we want the intensity of that, the duration, and obviously where it's going to occur. So based on, yes, there's a storm of significance coming in, we need to calculate intensities. Now, by intensities, I'm going to give this a very specific meaning, meaning wind speeds at various locations. Okay. So, um, and the way we're going to do this is using the new high resolution weather forecast. So they're at a resolution of approximately one and a half kilometers. And so we should be able to get wind information on a one and a half kilometer grid. And so that's how we're going to work out our predicted intensities over space and uh, over time. Um, so here's a typical output that you might see of a weather forecast. Um, showing the Burns Day storm, and you can see how this storm evolves um, over time and what the wind speeds would be. So what we want to do is we want to overlay that wind speed predictions with some sort of a, uh, exposure information. So our industry partner, Western Power, has provided us with their shape files of all of their infrastructure, and so now we know where infrastructure is um, uh, in in the region of interest and what we want to do so this is a picture of a typical of their infrastructure um, very very large databases and what we can do is we or what we propose to do is we are going to take the gridded forecast data and overlay it over the asset databases and this is a, a larger grid than we'll be using a finer grid than this, but if we make it much finer than this, you can't see the numbers. So you will get locations of wind speed at various assets. Now, what we want to do with that then is to say, well, if we know what the wind speed is at a particular um, overhead line or power pole, what is the likely damage that we can expect? And so that's the damage estimation. Now, the way we do this is by another thing that's used by the insurance industry called a fragility curve. And a fragility curve is a relationship between the intensity of an event and the probability of failure of an asset given that at the occurrence of that event. So I'll, I'll start with the right-hand one first because that's probably easier to um, demonstrate. But you might have, say, a flood depth and if you have some flood defense, then you have no uh, impact. But if that flood of defense gets overtopped um, and you have sensitive, say, electrical equipment, then you might get 100% failure because as soon as it's overtopped, then everything goes out. Typically, for wind and electrical infrastructure, or most infrastructure, actually, um, there's a probability of failure. No two lines are the same. Uh, they have different ages. They might be made of... Uh, they might have different spans, and so <coughs> we um, uh, we might get some relationship like this, whereby for low wind speeds, again, very low probability of failure, and for high wind speeds, uh, high and potentially 100% probability of failure. 
Now, we've been working with the Energy Networks Association and one of the DNOs to come up with some of these fragility curves. The, um, the way we're doing that is one of the things that the regulator requires is for um, all of the district network operators to record any fault information they've had and it also records, records when it was, how long it was for, um, approximately where it was and how many consumers were affected and, um, and all of this is actually audited so this is since I think it's 2003 this has been audited so this is accurate information about um, faults and consumers without power. What it doesn't do, however, is it doesn't say what wind speed. It will say it will say that wind caused the fault, but it won't say at what wind speed, what the wind speed was that caused that fault. So to be able to come up with these fragility curves, we need to work out what the wind speed was that caused that fault. Now, if you look at, um, so we have obtained time series of wind that we correlate with the fault. And the first thing we have to do is to decide what is a storm. So in our definition, we've chosen a threshold level of 17 meters per second, and this is typically where we start to find lines um, coming down. And when a wind speed crosses that threshold, we say it's a storm. And when it goes back below the threshold, we say the storm is finished. And if it comes back up again, then we have another storm. And we count the number of faults that occur in that storm and we pick the maximum wind speed in that storm as the wind speed that we're using in our fragility curves. Um, and we've, by, the, by a definition of 70 meters per second, we have the data set we're looking at, there's 3,000 storms that we're considering. Um, now the time series that we're using of observations, so we need to use observations, we're not actually using observations, what we're using is a thing called reanalysis data. And what reanalysis data, for those who don't know, is it is um, a weather forecast model or climate model which is run and every so often it is nudged back to reality or what the observations say. So you'll run a, a forecast model for say six hours, you'll have a look at the observations and then you'll interpolate back so that all of the readings uh, where you have observations equals those observations. This has two advantages. Uh, one, it um, allows you to obtain information that you may not have observations for, so in between the observations, or ones that you don't worry about that. So, um, the other thing is it provides them on a regular grid. And so now we have a 12 kilometer grid of wind observations between 2003 and 2010. Um, what I would say is, as I say, they're in highlighted I'm going to call them observations. They're not exactly observations, but they are very, very close. Um, okay. So, so you can see this is a point of one of the regions of interest. The red dots are showing how many storms we've had over, say, 17 meters per second in this example. As we up it to 25 meters per second, we can see we've got a nice large number of storms. Um, obviously getting smaller as the storms are getting rarer as they're getting um, more intense and uh, till we go down to 35 meters per second and that's pretty much the end of the record. So we know the faults from the NAFIS database, the number of faults and we know the wind speeds that they occurred by choosing the nearest grid point to where the fault was located and we can plot on all of this information and we have to normalize it by because some areas have a lot of asset, some areas have small assets, and so we normalize this fault information by um, dividing by the number of kilometers. And if we take the mean of this, then we can find, well, we, sorry, we take the average of all those wind speeds and fit a line to it, this becomes our fragility curve. Now, this is mean number of faults per kilometer, and you see they're very low. Um, but they also have a lot of assets. Um, so that's the final fragility curve. Um, but there's also uncertainty associated with that fragility curve. And so if you look at the red line that I've just plotted here, if you were to take a slice through this line, then you'd get a graph that looks like this. So for example, 
we have one fault occurred. So for a wind speed of, I think this is um, 27 meters per second, we had one fault recorded in the area of interest 30, uh, 27 times. And we had uh, up here um, 80 faults were only ever recorded once. Okay. And same, and these, these, uh, and um, or not eight faults, that's not 75 faults were recorded once, and you know, 15 faults were recorded once. So there's uncertainty involved. So when we do our Monte Carlo um, analyses, uh, simulations, we can actually put proper distributions through the means and get statistically, hopefully, statistically the same as what occurs in reality. So what we're hoping to do is come up with probabilistic information. So that first framework that I showed you, we can then run, we can get weather forecasts coming in. These curves here are probabilistic. We can run Monte Carlo simulations using these distributions and we can get failure information. We're hoping to, and we haven't done this yet, these are all um, made up, but they're all just arbitrary. Um, we're hoping that we can then get probabilistic um, understanding of, for example, electricity interruptions, which will then be maybe related to people in call centers or probability of a particular electrical fault. So in this particular case here, we might have a 50% probability that 100 properties are going to be affected, or we might have a 40% um, probability that they're going to only get one fault, and therefore we need so many linesmen to fix that. And potentially you can take this further and translate this sort of information to economic loss, economic losses, whether that is economic losses to the district network operator or even economic losses due to, say, downtime in industry or something like, like that. So that's uh, so we're hopefully taking these weather warnings and turning them into probabilistic and um, quantified information. So our final thing is um, to, so we've got the fragility curves now. We um, just have to incorporate it into a Monte Carlo tool with the weather forecasts. Um, we're going to do two tests. The first one is we're going to use our tool. We're going to use historic weather forecasts, calculate the predictions made by our tool, and compare those to the actual the, the predictions made by our tool, but rather than using forecasts, using actual wind observations. And the idea here is we're looking at the uncertainty resulting from errors in the weather forecasts. Once we've done that, we will use the historic weather forecasts and compare the predictions of faults calculated by our tool to the actual faults that occurred for a particular storm. And so this will give us an understanding of the accuracy of the tool. Uh, and then the final thing will be to change fault information into um, consumers without power. So that's where we're going, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, we will now have a session with uh, Q and A for for the speakers. So if you have any questions, please. Uh, let us know, as I said, use the questions tab on your right-hand side. And we've already got some uh, questions uh, lined up. Um, I start with some questions to Professor Douglas Crawford-Brown. Um, um, so this is a question on the... This is a question on the, um, on the chart. So... Um, Amanda is asking whether she's reading the charts correctly. Are they showing both an increase and a decrease in future wind speed over the UK? Uh, could you say that again? Is it is it showing? Yeah, it is showing both an increase and a, and a decrease in future wind speeds over the UK. Uh, it it does show both um, uh, occurring as part of the uncertainty bounds on it. So I'm. I'm not sure if my screen is showing up now on it, but um, uh, I, I, it doesn't matter. I can show it. Uh, 
Okay, it's, it's not so important. Um, it does have, uh, because of the uncertainty that we look at, it does have some estimates that are showing increases or some estimates that are showing decreases. On average, if one takes the, uh, the expectation value, it's not showing any change in the mean wind speed, which is very significant. It's showing changes which are on the order of uh, 5% or so, and that's one of the reasons why the wind energy companies, when they looked at the um, estimates out to about 2050, uh, weren't feeling that this was um, uh, going to change the way in which they took their investments. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I have two questions for Jeremy. And mm -hmm. please could you also uh, repeat the, what the threshold 500 micrograms per uh, cubic meter is? And uh, is this something relating to fil air filtration systems? And also if you could please clarify what the fresh over is. Uh, okay, so the, the, when we did the expert elicitation exercise with uh, EDF site staff, we proposed uh, a set of eruption scenarios of different ash concentrations at, at, at different um, durations. And what came out of the, 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 the judgment of the site experts was that 500 micrograms per cubic meter was a level where um, they would expect to have to reduce the maintenance intervals for filtration systems and that they would potentially uh, have to also consider issues about um, uh, filter component uh, supply stocks as well. So essentially, that I mean that threshold was just an example that I um, highlighted that came out of our study. That was uh, when we did the specific translation of the ground level concentrations to site impacts, which is um, uh, bespoke to uh, the nuclear plant operation, this was one of the key anticipated impacts and that was a threshold which was identified um, uh, through the formal expert judgment as being an important level to consider. Okay, thank you. And the next question is for Sean. So uh, you mentioned customers. Do they include business customers? And Amanda from your... Yeah, go on, sir. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm just trying to think of the. Uh, I, I'm, I believe so. Yes. Uh, the, the, it will be property interruption. So yes, it, I, I believe that's correct. That it will include businesses as well. Okay, thank you. And this also uh, takes me to um, another question. We are talking here about the energy and power sector, but I wonder whether you also engage other uh, organisations working in other sectors. So, uh, for example. Yorkshire Water or, um, I don't know, I think in the case of uh, uh, volcanic, volcanic ash, the air, air transport and airports would be very interested in, uh, in this tool. So it's a question for the three, uh, for Douglas, Jeremy and Sean. Um, perhaps I could start. Um, yeah, so we've actually used a similar, this is the first time we were linking it to weather forecasts. Um, what we've done, we've, li we've linked it to um, climate models before, so this same modeling approach can be used to, say, have a look at mitigation strategies for, or sorry, adaptation strategies for climate change, uh, and instead of using the weather forecast, you use uh, climate model output. And it can be you, and so we've done this, and the fragility curves, it's about getting fragility curves for the infrastructure and for the hazard. So if you can get the fault information and the hazard intensity, or, well, there's a number of ways that you can do it. Uh, so um, one of the ways is um, empirically, so you get a fragility curve using empirical data where you get fault information and hazard intensity information. You can do it analytically as well where you use computer models, or similar to what Jeremy did, you can do it by expert elicitation where you can ask experts if this event happens, what is the likely impact onto your infrastructure? So as long as you can get these relationships between hazard intensity and um, asset performance, and you can get the asset database, and then you can get the hazard, then yes, you could use it for flooding, you could use it, we've used it for 
um, the flooding in water supply systems uh, using climate model stuff instead of um, weather forecasts. We're also looking at actually using it as well, uh, looking if it can be used for um, volcanoes as well, actually. So I'll have to talk to Jeremy later on. <laughs> Okay, um, Douglas, Jeremy, would you like to add anything in terms of your project, like um, whether you have engaged other sectors or organizations? Yeah, so th this is this is Douglas. Um, we didn't on this project, but if you mention, remember, I mentioned that we had the Top Dad project, and um, we also were part of the Infrastructure Transition Research Consortium, led very well by by Jim Hall at Oxford. And so, in both of those, we took the the wind information, which influenced wind energy, and then looked at the issue of what are the cascading effects associated with that. So, your wind turbine is not producing enough power, your water distribution system doesn't have enough power in order to pump water, people begin to have microbial diseases because the, the pressure in the water main begins to go down and, and so on. So not as part of the NERC project, but as part of the series of projects that we linked the NERC project to. Um, this, is, this is Jeremy. In terms of the dissemination of our results then um, I've already mentioned uh, database of simulations being available um, as potentially a, a, an accessible source of uh, information that would inform rapid response so on time scales after an eruption that are shorter than where you could run bespoke simulations based on the current atmospheric conditions uh, our database in, in terms of broad weather patterns and eruption sizes would provide some initial estimates for that. Um, in our simulations we actually compute the ash concentration at all levels. What I just showed you was ground level concentration because that's relevant for UK infrastructure but actually we do, we do calculate in those simulations the ash concentration at all levels. So, it, um, so we're looking at ways of how we can disseminate this more widely. The, the, the issue of um, the response of aviation to the problem of volcanic ash is, is, is quite a complicated one and so we're trying to find uh, the, the best way to engage with the uh, relevant uh, agencies to, uh, to share that information at the moment. That's one of the things we're doing right now. Okay, thank you very much. So we're bit running a bit late, so I would like to draw it to a close. So thank you all the speakers, so Doug, Doug, Jeremy and Sean uh, for presenting and, uh, and also thank you all for, for attending. As I said, the slides will be available on Sirius website after the event and you might also be interested in uh, another sector specific uh, ERIC webinar. This would be focusing on the water sector and will be next month. The date has not been confirmed as yet. And you might also be interested in uh, another Syria event, Assessing and Planning for Resilient Critical Infrastructure, which would be on the 20th of October, uh, so in a few weeks' time. And uh, details of the event will be again on uh, our website. So thank you again for attending, and thank you all for all the speakers for, for presenting. And uh, thank you again. <laughs>